little bit of hosting on this first evening of Trek for this year. And um, glad to help anybody who has questions about the technology. But primarily what we wanted tonight is, is basically as Dr. Haken shares. And um, um, so what you wanna do is you wanna keep your microphone muted as he is sharing. And then at some point he will open up the floor to questions and then you can unmute yourself and, uh, and chime in. Of course, you can always ask questions or communicate via the chat, but the sound is the best when everyone but the speaker is muted. Also encourage you, if your internet is strong enough, I would encourage you to leave your camera turned on. That way we can actually see who's in the class and it feels a little bit more like actual class that way. Uh, anyway, I think that's, that's about it for those kinds of announcements. Um, it'll be about an hour and I'm going to open up in a word of prayer just to let you know if you didn't hear the announcement this morning from, from uh, Dr. Haken himself or from Chris and Darcy, Dr. Haken is part of our church. Uh, he was my prof five years ago at Heritage for church history and for pastoral epistles. I still remember those classes very well and I passed so that was a good thing. <laughs> and um, he's a uh, professor of church history at Southern Seminary down in Louisville, Kentucky. So we are very blessed to have him tonight and for the next number of weeks teaching us about Baptist history, uh, the purpose of it, and our own roots as a church and a denomination. So let me open up a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Let's pray. Thank you, oh God, for this Lord's Day and for the opportunity of gathering together and learning about our history and what it means to us today. Um, some of the beliefs that have been our foundation as a movement and what you have done yeah. in us. So God, I just pray that as oh, we turn okay. things over to Dr. Haken, that, that you would help us to learn and to grow, that our hearts would be to the Holy Spirit as he teaches us this evening. And may your church grow. May all of us be edified by what's done this evening. In the name of Christ. Amen. So Dr. Haken, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to be with you all. Uh, very thankful for this uh, technology that despite the context in which we find ourselves, uh, former generations who went through similar things like this and uh, we're not the first, um, didn't have this sort of uh, opportunity that we do to be able to connect uh, uh, despite being locked into our respective uh, homes. So as was mentioned, what I'm doing tonight is beginning a study of Baptist history. Um, I'll mention in a minute the details of the, the kind of contours of that history that I want to focus on. Um, I want to begin with a personal kind of remark. Um, as long as I can remember, I've been enamored with history, enthralled by it. Um, I'm sure if you were looking at this from a secular point of view, you might talk about certain psychological factors that have, might have played into that. Maybe there were genetic factors, uh, environmental factors. Um, I'll be honest, I tend to look at it as providential. Um, my father was an electrical engineer um, and uh, not really interested in history, never gave me much in terms of stimulation for being an interested in history. My mother had to leave school when she was about 12 and uh, she did receive a reward in Gaelic. She was Irish in Ireland. I don't recall my mother really, uh, you know, encouraging me either in this whole area. And so I, I look back and I, I see really the hand of God um, giving me an interest initially in Greek and Roman history. My earliest memory of school is tracing a drawing of the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar. Uh, that probably was when I was about four or five. Um, in England, when I grew up, we didn't have kindergarten. You went off right really to grade one. And um, so when I became a Christian in 1974 at Stanley Avenue Baptist Church, not surprisingly, I asked a deacon, 
I can still remember the dear brother. Um, so where did we come from as Baptists? And he said to me, well, you know, we're, we're Bible people, we're people of the book. And I'm not sure he used that phrase. That's a, actually a phrase from the Quran, but it's a word that it's a kind of a phrase that I've used again and again and again, where Christians are people of the book. And that's obviously, as we will see, absolutely essential to who we are. But I wanted more than that. I wanted like data, uh, people, places, some chronology. Uh, he really couldn't give me that. And it struck me, he really wasn't interested in that either. So he, he said, well, why don't you talk to the pastor? So the pastor was uh, uh, Bruce Woods. Some of you know Pastor Woods. And he was a great influence on my early Christian life. He baptized me as a believer. He married my wife, Allison, and I. Um, he was instrumental in my going to Wycliffe College uh, to study. Uh, it's interesting. He told me to go to Wycliffe rather than Central Baptist Seminary. I look back now and I realize that I don't think I would have survived at Central Baptist Seminary because I was wrestling with being a Baptist. Uh, a lot of it was the historical rootlessness that I got the impression from this deacon and others. And Pastor Woods was therefore a great influence on my life, but he had attended Dallas Theological Seminary, which when, when he went there in the 1950s, it was one of the best Bible colleges, schools in the United States, faithful to the scriptures, but their emphasis was Bible teaching, which that's what a pastor needs, but not history. They've never been known for their history. They've had a man for many years named John Hanna, who's a great historian, but that's not really what you, you don't go to of Dallas for history. And so he really couldn't direct me either. And so I lamented mightily, you know, why, why Lord, did you save me among a people who've got no history? You know, I, this has always been a very prominent, as I said, area of my life. Remember my father announced to my family in 1965 that we were going to emigrate to Canada. My response to him was Canada. I could tell you their history in half an hour. Now that's a silly little remark of a 10 or 11 year old but it gives you some idea, as you can imagine, the depth of angst and anxiety I had. I'm a Baptist, but like they don't have any history. And um, if you don't have a history, or if you don't know your history, you, you're really kind of cut off from your roots to some degree. And I'm sure all of you or many of you have had the experience of knowing somebody who, as they get older, started, starts to lose their memory. My um, father is wrestling with that now. And it's very difficult. It's very difficult to have conversations as they start to forget essential people and essential things. And, and when the church forgets who she is in terms of her past, we're like communities with dementia. And eventually people with dementia, we're coming to this point with my father, can't function in the largest cult context. You, you, you can't allow them to go out because they may not find their way home and things like that. And the church without roots doesn't know where she's come from and she's rootlessness. And she has a context of being rootless. and. As you think about that, you actually start to realize that in this regard, if we as Christians kind of live in that sort of state, we're actually kind of like our culture. One of the products of Western civilization is rootlessness. And I won't go into this in great detail, but ever since the 18th century, the period we call the Enlightenment, there has been a steady attack on the past, on tradition, on custom, and uh, to the point that now it's 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 embedded in absolutely every nook and cranny of Canadian, American, and European and Western life. Our passion is the present and the future, 
And the past, yeah, maybe we'll be interested in the past. You know, we watch a movie. You know, I love movies about Rome, like Gladiator. I'm not necessarily recommending it. It's a bit violent. Um, you know, and yeah, it's nice for two hours of entertainment. Um, but taking wisdom from the past, trying to find out who are we in the basis of where we've been. And things, I'm sure you know, are not getting any better. I was reading of a school board system in Massachusetts that is going to ban reading Homer because they think he's in teaching racist stereotypes. I'll be honest, I, I was horrified when I read that. The, the earliest book I remember reading was the Iliad in the child's version. I was six or seven. And uh, I'm not sure how much I understood, but I was, I was gripped by that book. And it, it's disturbing to me that there are movements in our culture that are banning reading large segments of our past because they just don't fit where our values are today. But that's one of the reasons why we do read the past. Because it's, it's like going to a foreign country and they confront you with the realization that maybe some of the ways you think as Christians, that maybe some of the ways we interpret scripture, well, maybe they're not right, or maybe we haven't exactly got it correct. So we need to know who we are. We need our roots. And uh, what I want to do in the series of lectures that follow this in the next number of weeks and uh, uh, really over the next uh, three months to the end of March is look at Baptist roots. And in some ways, I'm answering your question. If you have that question, I hope you do. Who are Baptists? Where did we come from? And uh, why is it important to be a Baptist? And uh, I'll be honest, at this point, whereas uh, in the 1970s, I wrestled with knowing why am I a Baptist? Uh, I was converted in a Baptist church, baptized as a believer. Um, by 1982, I was a convinced Baptist. It took about eight years wrestling. And maybe, maybe it was 1980, I, I don't know. But that, in 1982, I began teaching at Central Baptist Seminary. But I still really didn't know much about Baptist history until I was told in uh, mid-80s after the history of, teacher of Baptist history, Charles Tipp, decided no longer to teach Baptist history. Hey, can, you're teaching it next year. And I was thrown into the deep end of the water. This is what happens to professors in Bible college and seminary when they first start. They get thrown in the deep end of the water and they have to teach all kinds of stuff they weren't trained to teach. And that's great. And um, learning Baptist history gave, gripped me to the point now that I spend, I spend a lot of time reading Baptist history, particularly in the period we're going to look at, which is the 18th century. And sometimes you'll think this weird, you know, I lie awake at night wondering why did that happen in 1790? Why did that, why did that guy say that? I, I'll, you know, I'll be honest, I often go to bed meditating on things from the 18th century, thinking about them and what was God doing? What, what, what can we learn from that period? So as I said, I, history is the horizon of my life in many ways. So what I want to do in this course is I want to look at the early period of Baptist history, um, which really begins in England. We'll talk a little bit about that tonight in the 17th century, the early 1600s. And I want to look at tonight, I'm gonna to look at five characteristics of what it means to be a Baptist. Some of them you'll guess pretty easily. Others of them might be a bit of a surprise. And I really want to lay the foundations for looking at various figures in Baptist history, English Baptist history, Irish and Welsh Baptist history from roughly 1610 to about 1835. Um, I'm looking then at a, a slice of Baptist history that relates to the British Isles in Ireland. Um, all of the foundations of our life were laid in that period. How we do church, the music's different, but how we do church was laid in that period. 
our understanding of how church governance happens, our understanding of worship, our understanding of the Lord's table, of why we baptize believers by immersion, our understanding of how we link together other Baptist churches in associations, all of it is laid in this period. Uh, Baptist passion for mission, the centrality of preaching, it's all laid out in this period. So this is a very, very important period. All of the Canadian Baptist churches, all of them, bar none, except for maybe a few that come from Central Europe, German Baptists, Romanian Baptists, all of them, their roots go back to Britain. And I can, I could easily trace them. Stanley Avenue Baptist Church was founded in 1844, uh, sorry, 1870s, as a Sunday school wing of James Street Baptist Church, which no longer exists. The shell of it still is there on James Street in Hamilton. It was founded in 1844 by an English Baptist who arrived in Montreal and wrote a letter to the post office in Hamilton titled The Baptists in Hamilton. That's what was on the address. There was no Baptist church in Hamilton. Somehow it found its way to a couple of people and they basically told them, uh, the Lord is sending me to you as your pastor. It's kind of bizarre. And uh, he turns up in Hamilton, 1844, was met by some people and uh, becomes the first Baptist pastor in Hamilton, plants churches. Uh, James Street is one, Wentworth Street um, is another in the convention, James uh, Stanley Avenue is another, and a variety of others. But he was English, he was an English Baptist whose roots go back to England. And we could go through all of the Baptist churches pretty well in Ontario, Quebec, and the rest of Canada and find their roots either directly in England or America, which go back to England. So the English Baptists are very, very important. And uh, really what I'm doing here in some ways is laying foundations for Lord willing what I would like to do next year, which is a course on Canadian Baptist history. And contrary to my childish statement that I could sum up Canadian history, the whole shebang of it in half an hour. Um, I hope we can spend about 10 to 12 weeks talking about Canadian Baptists beginning in the Maritimes and then uh, in Quebec and Ontario and stretching out to the, the west of Canada next year. So um, what I'm going to do then tonight is look at patterns of Baptist life, themes and principles and key elements, and there are five of them. Um, I want to say a little bit about Baptist origins as well. And then next week, we're going to start things kind of chron chronologically. We're going to start in the 1630s and uh, look at events. Uh, we'll look at John Bunyan, eventually um, <laughs> men like John Gill, uh, women like Ann Dutton, the most prolific Baptist authoress in the 18th century, wrote about 50 books. Just a remarkable Christian woman, close friends with George Whitfield, the great evangelist, not so close friends with John Wesley. Uh, she wrote a book criticizing his view of perfection. They had some correspondence. He got so upset with her, he eventually told her, I don't think you're a Christian. Uh, that's, uh, we'll get to, we'll get to Anne. Anne Steele, the great hymn writer. Um, her hymns were probably among the top five best-selling hymns in the you can use that phrase of the 18th century if you had a kind of top of the pops, you know, one of these charts of the, the most best hymns. Uh, Anne Steele's right up there. Around 1900, our singing styles changed and Anne Steele went from being the fifth most representative, maybe fourth most representative hymn writer to being virtually completely forgotten. And there's a big... We've had some challenges, right, in what we call worship wars in the last 30 years. Well, there was a big battle in the 1870s through about 1910 as people began to prefer singing Fanny Crosby to Ann Steele. And uh, anyway, we'll get to, we'll look at some of that. Um, and then men like Andrew Fuller, who I've spent a lot of time thinking about and writing about and his close friend, William Carey, who is right there at the forefront of the modern missionary movement and the globalization of Christianity. And Baptists 
are immersed in this world of the outreach of the gospel. But as we'll see tonight, very quickly, it's part, it's been part of their DNA right from the get go. So first, let me say a little bit, all of that, all that's introduction. So first, let me say a little bit about Baptist origins. So where did we start? Now, there is some, and this was common in the 19th century who argued, Baptists go all the way back to the first Baptist. Who was that? John the Baptist, right? <laughs> it's pretty obvious. You read the New Testament. There's John the Baptist. He must have been a Baptist. That means the second Baptist was the Lord Jesus. And I could show you a number of books in the 19th century that argued this, that our Lord Jesus was the first Baptist. And this is a very common view, uh, especially in the United States, in the Southern states, but it was also here in Ontario. It's known as landmarkism. That's the technical word for it, landmarkism. And it's this idea that there has been a, uh, a, an organic thread going all the way back to the New Testament. So remember earlier I said, okay, Stanley Avenue Baptist Church was founded by James Street. It was founded by this English Baptist and I forget which church he came from in England, but you could go back to England and trace them all the way back very easily to 1610 or so. Ah, uh, but then where do you go? Well, the argument is there is a group of people called the Anabaptists. I'll talk about them in a second. In the 1500s, uh, they're a wide range of people. Some of them we know today yeah. as the Mennonites and Anabaptists. And uh, gospel people in their roots. Uh, other Anabaptists, you wouldn't want to cross the street to be associated with them. I mean, they were really weird people, like one of the Anabaptists who turned up at Martin Luther's door around 1520 named Nicholas Storch. He didn't believe in having Bibles, as he told Luther. We don't need Bibles if we got the Holy Spirit. And uh, he told Luther God had a message for Luther. And Luther said, well, what was, what was it? Well, it wasn't out of the scriptures. Uh, the previous evening, Storch had had a dream, and in the dream, he was lying in a field in a blue sky, and out of the west came a little cloud all the way over to where Storch was lying on the ground. Uh, and suddenly, out of the cloud came a hand with a mug of beer, and then turned it upside down. The beer came over Storch and woke him up. And Storch said to Luther, God's got a message for you. And Luther... <laughs> Luther had listened to him to that point and said, well, okay, so what's the rest? What's the message? God is angry with the world. And he walked away. Luther thought, the guy's just a wacko. I mean, I didn't need to have him tell me that. I, I knew that from Romans 1, right? Um, the wrath of God on the wicked. And there were some Anabaptists, as I said, we would not want to be associated with. But the argument goes, you know, the landmarks are, uh, argument is, You've got all these Baptist churches go back in England, and then we go back to the Anabaptists. But then what do you do? Well, they find various groups in the Middle Ages who were not part of the Roman Catholic Church, like the Lollards. You don't need to remember all these names, the Lollards and the Waldensians and the Paulicians and the Bogomils. And all of these people had problems with the Roman Catholic Church. But that doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses have got deep problems with the Roman Catholic Church, but we wouldn't want to uh, include them in any line of uh, Christianity. And so the argument is that you can trace this organic link all the way back to the apostles. And the, the reason for this argument is Matthew 18, where Jesus says, I will, I will establish my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against her. And the big question is, how do you read that little word church there? Is it the local church or is it the universal church? If it's the local church, then you have to find individual churches all the way back to the New Testament. I tend to think it's the universal church. The word church in the New Testament is used 90% of the time to mean local church. 
But a number of times, especially in Ephesians and Colossians, it means the entirety of God's people. And I think there have been times when it would have been very difficult to find a faithful local church in the Middle Ages. But God has always had his people. And I think that saying is true, that God has established his church, the universal church. The men and women who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ alone for salvation, who are part by their indwelling of the spirit, part of the body of Christ, universal. So the landmarkists were driven by that verse. To, to, they didn't believe it was the universal church. In fact, the landmarkists didn't believe, they, they, they argued there is no such thing as the universal church. Therefore, what kind of church? It has to be a local church. That means there have been faithful Baptist local churches all through history, and we have to find them. Very few historians, Baptist historians, believe that today. I don't believe that um, because I don't believe that that verse speaks about the local church, but about the universal church. So that's one view of Baptist origins. In other words, we've always existed. Um, I think some of the reason for that also is they don't want to uh, admit that we came from the Reformation, that our roots lie in Lutheranism or Calvinist congregations in Switzerland or Anglicans. The second argument is that our roots are the Anabaptists. And uh, it would take me too long to argue that I don't believe that. I think the Anabaptists, Mennonites, Hutterites today, they read the same Bible as the early Baptists. They read the same Bible as we do. And not surprisingly, they come to some similar convictions. But there's a lot of differences, major differences. For instance, a central part of Mennonitism is pacifism that it is wrong. In fact, early Mennonites, it is wrong for a Christian to be a magistrate, to be engaged in capital punishment, to be a police officer, and to engage in war. Should there be such? Sure. The Mennonites were not wanting anarchy, but they, should, they argued you cannot be a Christian and be a police officer. You cannot be a Christian and be a politician. And you definitely can't be a Christian and be a soldier. And that has never been part of Baptist life. Right from the get-go, we have affirmed not only that God has established the state as a vehicle for maintaining law and order, but that it is, it is not inappropriate for a Christian to be a politician, to be a police officer, or to be a soldier. And if our roots were in among the Anabaptists, you'd think that there would have been some early Baptists who would have had the Anabaptist idea of pacifism. There is no evidence. On, you have to wait until about the 19th century that you start to get some Baptists arguing, we should not engage ever in war. And in the First World War, you have Baptists, some Baptists who are conscientious objectors. I don't know if there were any, I know of some in the First World War. I'm not sure if there were any in the Second. I'm sure there might've been some, but it's never been a major part of our, of our thinking. Now, the Mennonites might be right. I think they're wrong, but again, this is a one, the, we're not gonna study Mennonites by the way, but it's one, if you study the Mennonites, it confronts you with this question, are they right on this issue? What are the verses they bring? What are the Bible arguments they bring? And why would I disagree with them? So I do not think our roots lie among the Anabaptists. Our roots lie among the Puritans. Now, who are they? Now, let me go uh, back to the, uh, in other words, our roots are in England, among the Church of England. And uh, the Church of England established itself formally in 1534. One of the reasons why some people don't like history is all the dates and um, dates aren't the essence of history, but they are very important. And um, so there will be some dates we'll have to talk about. So 1534 is the, it's known as the act of supremacy when Henry VIII declared himself the head of the church. Now the, this is known as the 
pol the political beginning of the English Reformation, um, the establishment of the Church of England in 1534. Let me show you a, a picture and it'll come up on all your screens. You don't need to worry about doing anything. Um, that illustrates this. Now, can everybody see that? Yep. Yeah, everybody, okay, good. Um, this was executed. Uh, maybe that's not the best choice of words. <laughs> this was drawn, this is a, 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 a painting that was in the possession on one occasion of, for a number of years of Henry VIII. In fact, he probably commissioned it. And it represents the formation of the Church of England. You'll notice, and you can see my cursor, I think, uh, these are the four evangelists, right? They've got John, you see, he's got a rock, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and it's been hidden by his hand. And they are engaged in stoning the Pope. There he is right here. Um, the Pope actually was Paul III. The depiction here is more like an earlier Pope known as Julius II. And he's being stoned by, by the four evangelists with two figures. One is Avara, Avarice. The other is hypocrisy, hypocrisy. In other words, this is a very graphic illustration that the English Reformation is founded on the scriptures and is doing away with the authority of the Church of Rome. Now, a little funny part to this, I, I came across this recently and was thinking about it. Um, I've seen, I've known about it for a long time, but what struck me was, um, you know, at times I'm very upset by the the language that Christians use of each other on the internet. And then I remembered the Reformation. <laughs> and uh, we are nowhere near as violent as that period. But that's a, that's a very nice little picture that kind of illustrates uh, what I'm trying to emphasize is the Reformation in England begins with the scriptures. The Church of England wanted to base itself on the word of God. By the reign of Elizabeth I, Henry VIII's daughter, and let me show let me show you Elizabeth in all her all her regalia. Uh, I actually I really like Elizabeth I as a queen. And uh, um, here's Elizabeth. Uh, this was this was painted after the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. And man, I mean. She is decked out in all of her finery and jewels. Uh, she was an, we would describe it today as an evangelical. She was, in fact, technically she was a five point Calvinist. She believed in the five points of Calvinism, um, but she had a big quarrel with a group of people that we call the Puritans. And, um, when she became queen in 1558, there was no doubt England was a Protestant nation. In fact, over the next 150 years, England will define an Englishman and English women will define themselves by the fact that they are Protestant and not Catholic. I grew up in England as an Irish, which is also a problem. Catholic, in an Irish Catholic home. And you're an outsider, very much an outsider into that culture. And that was, that was even true in the 50s and 60s. That's changed, radically changed now. Um, but England will define themselves as we are Protestants, we're not Catholics. And so there was no doubt that England was now in the Protestant orbit. The question was, to what degree was that foundation in the word of God going to shape every area of life? Elizabeth was very happy with three things. Number one, she was a Calvinist. She actually corresponded with John Calvin for a period of time until one of John Calvin's protégés, John Knox, wrote a book called A Trumpet Blast Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. That was the title of the book, 
a trumpet blast against the monstrous regiment of women. He printed it in Geneva. He aimed it at Mary, Queen of Scots, his Scottish monarch. It wasn't aimed at Elizabeth, but Elizabeth thought it was and basically was furious at John Calvin, in who in turn was furious at John Knox for writing such a book because Calvin really was trying to cultivate a good relationship with, with Queen Elizabeth so he might influence her theologically. So she was a Calvinist, but she believed in what we call Episcopal church government. That is the government of the church is by bishops, not by elders or ministers, and definitely not by congregations. I mean, that's complete anarchy. No, no, there were about 20 bishops in England. She could get them all into one room and tell them, okay, boys, they're all men, right? Okay, boys, this is how we're gonna run the country, religiously. She liked that arrangement. Uh, when one of the bishops, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Grindle, once said to her, Madam, remember you are a mortal subject who will one day face an immortal God. That is not the way you spoke to Elizabeth I. She, she put him under house arrest. He never preached again over the next 10 years of his life. If she'd been her father, he would have chopped his head off, but she wasn't that brutal. She was the head of the church. In fact, uh, one of my delights, uh, again, you can disagree with me on this. Uh, I'm a monarchist. I am thankful that we have a queen, um, but that queen is the head of the Church of England. And uh, she's my monarch as a Canadian subject, but she's not the head of my church, thankfully. Uh, and as we'll see, the Baptist, early Baptists will have problems with that issue. So the Puritans then had problems with who's the head of the church? Is it the queen? Or should the elders run the church? And so in the 1570s, 1580s, the Puritans began to argue. They're, they're a group of men and women who've spent some time in places like Geneva and Zurich and Lausanne and Frankfurt, where they have seen reformed congregations who were reformed according to the word of God. And when they come back to England, they want a thoroughgoing reformation. They've also got some other problems. The queen, for instance, insisted that when you receive the Lord's Supper, you had to come to the front of the church building, kneel at an altar rail and receive it that way. That reminded the Puritans of the Roman Catholic Church of the Middle Ages. They didn't like that. They also didn't like this thing. That's a wedding ring. Because they remembered that wedding rings came from Germanic paganism. And they're not in the Bible. Right? You can't find wedding rings in the Bible. Now, I've been to many weddings and I know, you know, when the rings are given, sometimes there's you know, the ring is a symbol of love and love has no beginning and no end. And we talk about 1 Corinthians 13 and it's all very true and lovely, but 1 Corinthians 13 is not about weddings, right? In its origin and there's no wedding rings in there. And uh, as far as we know, early Christians never gave wedding rings to each other. Now, why do I wear a wedding ring if my Puritan forebears didn't? Well, I think they're wrong on that issue. And I think given the the nature of the battle we're engaged in for what is marriage in our culture, I think it's a good thing to wear a wedding ring. But the Puritans, no, 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 no. It's not biblical. And in fact, the Puritans wanted, and this becomes, this is now where I'll turn to Baptists. The Puritans wanted a very key thing, which is only that which is commanded in the word of God should we do in worship. And that's, that's the first Baptist principle. Baptists emerge from the Puritan movement. They actually emerge from, there's a group of Puritans who eventually give up any hope of reforming the Church of England. They leave the Church of England and become what they call separatists. 
And this happens in the 1590s. Elizabeth was not going to stand it. She executed a number of their leaders. And the separatists became convinced that when we read the word of God, the state is not linked to her. And we should have independent congregations. And it's out of these men and women that Baptists emerged. Some of us have remembered the sailing of the Mayflower to America in October, November of 1620, 400 years ago. And it's the, these people were separatists. And it's among these people that some people, as they go back, they go back to the Bible and ask the question, what does God say about how the church should be governed? And the thing they find in the New Testament is when Paul had a problem in Corinth, right? He didn't write to the emperor Nero. <laughs> There's no letter of Paul to Nero saying, you know, like, we've got this real problem in Corinth. We've got, we got this guy who's living with his stepmother. And we've got people taking Christians to court. And we've got people speaking in tongues when they shouldn't in the worship service. And we got some people there claiming that there's no resurrection of the body. Can you help us? I mean, Paul never does that. But that's what's going on in England. You know, the bishops have got a problem. And he turns up to Elizabeth and says, you know, I got a guy in my parish who's doing this. What should I do? Well, put him in prison or whatever. I mean, the early, so the early, early separatists and the Baptists come out from them, realize, no, no, the state and the church are two institutions founded by God, but they should not be conjoined. The, the state has no right dictating the inner life of the church. And likewise, notice it goes the other way. To what degree should the church then be shaping the state? and the culture. No wonder, so these early Baptists then, as, and as they're reading the Bible, they start to realize there's no examples of infant baptism in the New Testament. A number of years ago, I remember hearing a debate between Alistair Begg and uh, R.C. Sproul on believer's baptism, or on baptism. Alistair, Alistair Begg gave his, his talk, and then R.C. got up, and I loved R.C. Sproul in terms of his teaching, but I'll never forget the his opening sentence. He said, now when it comes to a verse defending infant baptism in the New Testament, well, frankly, there isn't one. <laughs> and at that, point, at that point, I thought, that's the end of the debate. I mean, <laughs> Alistair Begg has won this one, but as you, if you've got Presbyterian friends, and I do, and Anglican friends, and I do, um, they could say a few more things, but they have to go back to the Old Testament and circumcision of children. And Anyway, he spoke for another hour. Why? Even if there isn't a verse in the New Testament, nonetheless, we should still baptize babies. Well, these early Baptists were reading the New Testament, uh, separatists rather, and they, some of them become convinced there's no baptism of babies in the New Testament. There's only baptism of believers. So that's the first principle. And I'm, I'm, I need to look at my time here at 6.43. Uh, Baptists are Bible people. So that, that Baptist deacon I spoke to back in 1974 when I was converted. And I said, who are Baptists? Where do we come from? And he said, we're people of the book. He, he spoke better than he knew in some ways. Um, or maybe he did know in, in emphasizing as i said i don't think he was interested in baptist history so i don't think he was reflecting the, the past so much as the present but that's we are we are a people of the book that when it comes to the life of our churches the holy scriptures are supreme this does not mean i've spent my life studying church history this does not mean church history is of no value um some of you may have seen posts that I've made on recent days regarding issues relating to our churches and issues of lockdown and so on. And one of the things I've been emphasizing to the dismay of some of my friends is we need to read how Christians in the past have thought about these issues about church and state relations. In fact, it's made me realize that when we're training potential church leaders in our seminaries, we don't teach anything about political theology. 
We say nothing about this whole area. I'm thankful I did do half a course on political ethics in seminary. Uh, what are our, what is my duty as a citizen? What are the what are the the, the limits of state? How what can the state say to the churches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And um, uh, the past, what we call tradition, is not negligible. I, I love that statement of a great Baptist, C. H. Spurgeon, who once said, "I am always amazed that men and women who are so enamored of what the Holy Spirit teaches them in the Scriptures." are so dismissive of what he has taught others. Not the first people to read the Bible. Our situation here of, with lockdown and the whole, I'm not, I don't want to get into that, but that, our situation, we're not the first to confront these issues. On what are the limits of the government? What can they say to us? What should we obey? When, when when can we as Christians engage in disobedience to the state? There's a whole history. And I realize that for many, many ways, we haven't taught that and we haven't talked about that. And we, we, we need to draw upon the tradition. So when Baptists emphasize Holy Scripture is the foundation of our lives, they are not dismissive of the past. But what they are saying is that ultimately, if God clearly, explicitly commands it something in his word, that is what must be obeyed. The second principle, that's the first principle. The second principle is this, is that the church is not made up of every Tom, Dick, and Harry that happens to be born in a certain area. In the Church of England in the 15, 1600s, Everybody was born in a parish, and there was one church in that parish. So for sake of illustration, let me use West Highland as the illustration. Let's say West Highland is the parish church of a radius of about five square miles. Um, I'm not sure if that is mathematically correct. You will find out if you don't know, I am mathematically challenged. Um, so radius, square mile, I'm not sure those two things go together. That's what I'm saying. Uh, so please don't think to yourself, the guy hasn't got a clue what he's talking about. Uh, I might be wrong on that, but I hope the illustration holds. So let's say West Highland is the parish church. That means, let's say you're born within three miles of West Highland. That's your church. You're taken there. You're baptized as a baby there. Your baptism is your entry into the church and your citizenship of the state. Everybody in England in 1610, 1620, when the early Baptists emerge, is baptized or christened as a baby. Everybody. You don't have a choice in it. And the early Baptists start to realize when they read the Bible, that doesn't look like the New Testament. It doesn't look like New Testament church life. New Testament church life are men and women who are converted. And they joined the church through the rites or ordinance of baptism. Baptism is the doorway into the church. Early Baptists would not baptize anybody who had no intention of joining the church. You, you couldn't just turn up. There, there were a few exceptions to this, but up until probably the 1800s, you couldn't just turn up to a Baptist church and say, hey, I've become convinced I should be baptized as a believer. And then the leadership of the church say to you, well, are you planning to join our church? Well, no, I don't. I want to join your church at all. I just want to get dumped. <laughs> they wouldn't do it. No, no. The way into the into these early churches is through baptism. What these men and women have realized is that the church of the living God is a church of willing men and women. We have freely engaged to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not conscripts. I mean, don't push the analogy too far. In the, in the uh, Second and First World War, because of the nature of the conflict, our government had to levy conscription. Um, given the nature of where we are today and the thinking that 
Uh, well, I don't know if we'd ever have conscription again. And the thinking that women sh should serve as equally alongside men, I I'd hate to think that we would be conscripting women. But that's another big question too. Like, you need to be careful. I need to be careful not getting stuck on these rapid trails. But you, you know what? Conscription is, you don't have a choice. You, if you're able-bodied, you're in the army. Well, that's not the New Testament model. The New Testament model is the sort of army we've got today. It's a volunteer army. My, my son joined the army briefly, and he wasn't conscripted. And I remember the ceremony in which he had, you know, took an oath of allegiance to the queen, which was very interesting. Not the Canadian government. It was still an oath of allegiance to serve her majesty. But he, he was a volunteer. And uh, that's the New Testament model. Is we freely embrace the gospel by the work of the spirit and we join the church. And so the model is very different from the parish model of the, uh, of the Anglicans and the Roman Catholics and the Presbyterians, because the Presbyterians wanted a state church too. Most of the Puritans are Presbyterian. A few of them, like the Baptists who come out of that world, are Congregationalists. And not only are they convinced of believers' baptism and membership in the local church of people who voluntarily join it, but they also believe who has the final authority in the life of the church? Well, obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Everybody believes that. I mean, Elizabeth I believed that. That's why she was so insistent that she had to run the church because she was convinced that one day she would stand before a holy God and give an account of how she ran the Church of England. I, I can't imagine the weight of that authority that she felt. But that was her conviction. But she was wrong from the New Testament standpoint. The New Testament, and I'm a Congregationalist, supports either Congregationalism very clearly that the authority in the local church ultimately resides in the congregation who appoints elders and gives authority to the elders as leaders. The church is never leaderless in the New Testament. Or the authority lies with the elders. And early Presbyterianism, there was no voting the elders in. Elders appointed elders. In our model, we congregation appoints elders. I'm raising a lot of things here, I know. I could spend an hour on each of these things. But that's the second major principle, is a congregational rule and believer's baptism. The third principle flows out of that, and that's freedom, religious liberty. The church should be free to govern her life. The state has no right to tell the church when we, when we called Pastor Mahaffey and Pastor Roberts and Pastor Strickland and the other pastors in our church, we called them. We didn't have to go to the mayor of Hamilton and say, you know, we're, we're appointing Pastor Strickland. Is that okay with you? No. They, they have no right to say that. The, the church, the state has no right to say, you know, there are certain things within your life of your church you should do and you shouldn't do. Now, I know that we've come up against this whole issue of the lockdown, to what extent, and there, that's a, that's a much bigger issue. It's got to do with one of, the, one of the reasons for the state is to guarantee the health of a nation. But there's no doubt about that. That's just part of political thinking for centuries that the state has a right under God to secure the health and security and stability of the nation. So what, what we're doing, what we're coming in here is that there's a clash. Can the state then say, well, you can't meet in person? Um, as I said, I, I don't wanna get involved in that, but I, I hope you see what I'm saying. The, the state and church are both ordained entities by God but they're not meant to be married. And the early Baptists believed in religious freedom, not only for themselves, but also for others like Roman Catholics. And like Jews, 
In fact, one of the one of the first major thing a number of Baptists will be involved in with some Puritans in 1655, after 400 years, they will invite the Jews to return to England. All the Jews had been kicked out in 12 the 1200s. And Oliver Cromwell, who is a Congregationalist, will spearhead with Baptist support, inviting the Jews to come back to England. His, his belief was, we need to bring the Jews back, and when they see what we're doing in England, they'll all get converted, and Jesus will return. Well, it didn't exactly happen that way, but... Uh, and there was a love that these men had for the Jewish people. But even Muslims... About three years ago, a very prominent Baptist leader, Russell Moore in the Southern Baptist Convention, supported the building of a mosque in downtown New York, not far from the Twin Towers. And he came under enormous fire in the Southern Baptist Convention, the annual convention that year. Uh, now maybe the choice of, of uh, locale was a problem and I think it was, but the principle, if we want religious liberty for ourselves, and surely we do, we need to grant it to others, even if we don't agree with them. I do not agree with Muslims. I think they have badly misunderstood the scriptures. But I need to be prepared to defend the right of Muslims to build mosques, not to engage in terrorism, of course. And likewise with Jehovah's Witnesses, etc. If I am for religious liberty for us, then we must be for it for all. It was Oliver Cromwell who once said, you know, everybody wants to, everybody talks about religious liberty and once they get it, they won't give it to anybody else. And Baptists by and large in the early years, this was a key principle of religious liberty. So uh, the scriptures, the centrality of the word of God, congregational church rule, uh, which is linked with believers baptism, religious liberty. And then uh, fourthly, evangelism. And uh, I'm gonna just mention that here. That is a key mark of early Baptists. Early Baptists were passionate about preaching the gospel. Let me just read to you a little thing by John Bunyan. And uh, I'll put a picture here of John Bunyan up. He's an early Baptist leader. Um, and this, uh, this is a line drawing that was made from real life. And uh, let me blow that up a little. This is a pencil drawing, it's in the British Museum, uh, made in his lifetime. Uh, interesting, the hair. <laughs> uh, maybe not what you thought Bunyan looked like, but that's, that's, uh, that's a, a, a contemporary drawing of Bunyan. And uh, here's Bunyan's words when he was converted. He said this, my great desire in my ministry was to get into the darkest places in the country, even among people who are furthest off a profession of faith, not because I couldn't endure the light, but because I found my spirit lean most after awakening and converting work. And the word I carried did lean itself most that way. And Bunyan, I've been to Bedford where he ministered. And if you know, if you know people who can take you around, you can go to you can go around Bedford, Bedfordshire. And people will point out oak trees. You know, oak trees live a they live a long time, centuries. And people will say, Bunyan preached under that oak tree. Or they'll point out barns in which Bunyan preached. I'm sure some of them are apocryphal, but where there's smoke, there's fire. And uh, I, Bunyan preached wherever he could get a hearing. And that has been a, very central to Baptist life, the preaching of the gospel to the lost. And we'll see how that fleshes out uh, down the road in uh, early Baptist thinking. Bunyan got himself arrested for that. He was arrested in 1660. He was told... Uh, if you'll just give me go back to being what you were trained to be, he was trained to be a tinker, that is a mender of pots and pans, we'll let you go. And Bunyan's response was, I can't do that. God has given me a gift to preach the gospel. The congregation in Bedford has called me to preach the gospel. 
I cannot do anything but else, anything but that. They said, fine, John, you'll stay in prison until you come to your better senses. He was in prison for 12 years. Uh, John Newton said, God has his ways in working providentially in men's lives. If Bunyan hadn't been shut up in that prison, he says, he wouldn't have written Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, he started that book in the prison. When he was in prison, he, he asked the Lord, not surprisingly, 12 years. He was the longest Baptist minister imprisoned. What are you doing in my life? And he said, it's a beautiful line. The church in the fire of persecution is like Esther in the perfuming chamber being made ready for the presence of the king. You remember Esther was a year being made ready, right? I, I can't imagine what they were doing for a year, but they, they were making her ready to go into the Ahasuerus' presence, or as he's known by the Greeks, Xerxes the first. And uh, what a way to talk about prison. It's like a perfuming chamber. Man, if, if, if Bunyan could say that about his prison then, I mean, they, they were horrific dens. I don't know, what do you think of our prisons, you know, with three meals a day and television and university courses and, but why do, what a, it's a remarkable statement, but that's the fifth mark of early Baptist life, being willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Five marks, the scriptures as the foundation of our life, our faith, our worship, Congregational church government linked to believers' baptism. Religious freedom, religious liberty. Evangelistic, passionately evangelistic. And then quite know, knowing what it means to suffer for the sake of the gospel. And uh, it's not until probably the 1820s, 1830s that Baptists will start to emerge as regular citizens. They will be second-class citizens for decades in England and Wales and Ireland. And for a portion of that, persecuted by the state. And that, that get built into the warp and woof. We, we've known really nothing like that, but our forebears experienced that. And we need to remember, we need to remember that. And when I, teach church history, or I spend some time on the persecution of Baptists because I think it's something we need to know. We need to know it in light of the, the worldwide church. We need to know it in case, and God forbid, but in case we go through the same, that it might help us in such a time. Anyway, let me stop here. Um, I think we have about 15 minutes for questions. And then we'll, we'll end right at 715 uh, with a word of prayer. So you can unmute yourself or you can write the question in the chat box uh, that uh, uh, Pastor Strickland has indicated. Or you just, yeah, if you unmute yourself, you can just ask me directly. So don't, don't be bashful. Uh, Dr. Haken, I have a question about the earliest Baptists. Um, were they, you said that, was it the first, I think your first point was that we were people of a book um, and uh, our forebears wanted to base their liturgy on the Bible. Was it mostly just New Testament or was it the whole Bible as um, the basis for what they would plan and do in their services? Yeah, it's, it's, it is mostly New Testament. So, uh, I mean, they're, they're, like a number of the Puritans, they did not believe that the Old Testament temple worship was a pattern. So singing, for instance, which is mentioned in the New Testament, was always a cappella. So when, and initially singing was only the Psalter. 
So we'll look at this. There, there is a, there's a worship war in the 1690s when uh, Benjamin Keach says, I think we should be singing hymns that speak about Jesus explicitly. And some Baptists will say, no, 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 we've already got a hymn book. Uh, God gave us that hymn book. It's a Psalter. Don't need any, any of men's creations. So that's a, that's a battle. And then there's a huge battle in the 1800s, which we won't get to, when they introduced the organ. Uh, as, as some of the Plymouth Brethren at that time said, oh, yeah, the, the, the dumb brother who uh, yeah, they, they would call the organ. And there are battles about organs. Uh, Christians, uh, maybe it's, it, it's part of the fun of church history, but it's, it's really a bit sad in some ways. Uh, we, we fought about all kinds of things, you know, candles on tables, uh, stained glass windows, um, organs, indoor baptistries. There'll be a battle about that. Should we have indoor baptistries? Uh, the, the classical Baptists always baptized in rivers and streams. They love that because they, you can bear witness to unbelievers who'd come to watch you. Uh, should we have evening services? Initially, they only had afternoon services because of no indoor lighting. And uh, when people suggested, why don't we have evening services? People could go home, have their meal, and then come back after, after their afternoon meal and so on. And a lot of Baptist leaders said, no, no, we let people go home. They won't come back. So there was battles over that. And anyway, yeah, so uh, yeah, it's the, it's the New Testament model that they're, they're drawing for their understanding of worship. So 1 Corinthians 14 would be an example that they draw from, you know, where Paul does describe worship to some degree. I think one of the, uh, one of the things I do disagree with my, those earlier Baptist forebears is they believed that God had given them an exact blueprint of every detail. And I think most of us would probably say, well, there's certain things that God didn't give us exact details about and We have to use principles to come to the way, the, the way we do things. Um, there's no details about, you know, uh, ushers, uh, bulletins, <laughs> uh, announcements, you know, and um, churches have different traditions and that's fine. Uh, how do you receive the Lord's Supper? So I went to a church in, in Louisville and I had never heard this word. I, in like 25 years of teaching church history, intinction. And I had to ask somebody, you know, uh, who went to the congregation, like, what, what's intinction? Oh, he says, when you go up to get this Lord, the Lord's Supper, because they, they, they have, you go up at a station and they have the bread and the wine. You take the bread and you dip it in the cup. And you don't get the individual cup. And so I don't agree with that. But, you know, should we, and should you receive the Lord's Supper? We do it sitting. Should it be kneeling? Should it be standing? I mean, those early disciples, right? It was reclining. Because <laughs> that, that, that's, that's the way you ate your meal. I can't imagine eating a meal reclining. The surefire way to get indigestion, but. Anyway, so I mean, there's a lot of details that the scriptures don't give us, and that's fine, I think. But a number of the early Baptists, though, they wanted an exact blueprint. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi. Can a politician, politician, police, a soldier become a Christian in Canada now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to, to talk to Mennonite churches today, probably the old order Mennonite, you know, the Amish, they would, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain they would not allow a member of their congregation to be a politician or to be a police officer or to be a soldier. But that's not, that's, that's not been an issue for us at, in any of our Baptist churches. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Michael, when I grew up in Verdun, we went to Emmanuel Baptist Church, pastored by John McLeod, previously by uh, Harold James, who lived in Hamilton. We use a study was called 
got this distinctives. You probably heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I remember about it was a regenerate church membership was one of the keys. Yeah, that really was what was coming out in the second, uh, the second principle that I was bringing out. Again, for the sake of time, I probably didn't bring it out as clearly as I should have. So congregational church government with, with believer's baptism. So believer's baptism basically presumes regenerate, that the person being baptized can make a profession of faith. And, uh, but that, yeah, that, again, that, that's got to do with the whole area that I did bring out in the analogy with the army. So the early Baptists wanted men and women who had voluntarily embraced Christ. And they weren't simply conscripted. You, because you were born in England, you're automatically an Anglican. Well, the early Baptists disagreed with that. And so that would be the regenerate church membership. There is a question there. Um, uh, Oh, is this, is this, uh, uh, somebody said this privately, I, uh, about pouring, pouring, Baptist, Baptist baptized by pouring water, and then began immersion. Um, the er, first Baptist, John Smith, who we'll talk about briefly next week, um, uh, would have poured water, and it was not by immersion. Immersion is rediscovered in 1641. And by that point, there are probably half a dozen Baptist churches. And from that point on, immersion becomes the, the mode that Baptists argue for. There has always been a very small group, maybe 5% of Baptists, who have argued that the mode is not important. They've argued that um, uh, pouring, never normally sprinkling, but pouring is, is feasible. Um, by and large, the Baptist tradition has been immersion of a believer um, is the mode and the proper subject. And the strength of the emphasis being their believer. So you've got a, a child of 12 if they're a believer. Uh, that's another issue which we could get into as well down the road. At what age should a, a believer be baptized? Um, Baptists generally between 12 and 18 and rarely baptized anybody under 12. Uh, 12 was 12 is a critical age. That's when normally you finished uh, what we call uh, middle school. 80% uh, of people were in the workforce at 12. You could get legally married at 14. Um, we've changed that, I know. But um, the world in which we're talking about and we'll be talking in the next, you know, three or four months, two, two months, um, there's no such thing as teenagers. Uh, 12 years old, you're in the workforce. And 12 years old, sometimes leave home, become apprentices. William Carey did at 12, left home at uh, 12 years old, became an apprentice uh, shoemaker. Um, so immersion then started in 1641, very, very early on. Um, Okay, any, maybe one last question and then I'll close with prayer. Nope, okay. Um, please don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, uh, next week, what I want to look at is uh, kind of some of the history of the early Baptists, um, 16 teens to about the 1680s. And I'm going to focus on Baptists and confessions of faith, uh, how Baptists saw the confession of faith as important to the life of the church. Well, let me close in prayer. Thank you and for all of you coming. Um, the pattern that I did tonight will be similar to what I'll do through the rest of the, the time together. Uh, I'll probably have more pictures and maybe some texts as well um, that we'll be reading, but normally speak for about 50 minutes with Q&A at the end. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray together. Our Father, we bless you for our roots, for those who came before us, who shared the gospel by which we came to faith, and the men and women who shared the gospel with them, and so on. We thank you for your faithfulness as a sovereign God in history, guiding your people, preserving and keeping your church. 
And we do pray that our reflections tonight would be helpful and ultimately would bring glory to your name. I pray that uh, each of those listening, that you would keep them uh, this week, uh, help them spiritually, uh, despite these very trying days, remind us afresh that you are indeed a God present to help, a God present to hear the prayers of his people, present with his people by your blessed Holy Spirit. Uh, be with all within the earshot of my speaking. Keep us this week. And we ask these mercies for Jesus' sake. Amen. Very good. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. God bless.